Thank you, Jean-Pierre. So first, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, so basically uh, Valentin and Stefano, for putting together such a nice uh, workshop. Uh, so on this broad spectrum from policy making to neural coding, uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to be representing, I guess, neural coding. Uh, and so I'm, I'm basically a theorist. So I'm, I mostly work with computational modeling, but models. But today uh, I will present some, some data analysis that I think is directly relevant to the topic of the session, which is uh, the coding of, of the decision variable. And so this will be uh, electrophysiological data in, in an, uh, collected in animals, and I will be talking about the auditory cortex, which is, might seem like an unlikely area for decision-related activity, but I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the auditory cortex might be doing much more than what uh, we usually expect it to do. Um, yeah, so the, the big question we're all interested in is how does the brain transform incoming stimuli into into actions. And so we have um, a nice uh, textbook uh, cartoon for this. Uh, well, so the stimuli arrive first in, in sensory areas, which are believed to, uh, f to, to represent uh, the, the essential sensory features in the best possible way, and then relay them to higher areas, which progressively transform stimuli into, into action, so stimuli into decision, and then eventually in, a, in action. Uh, so this this picture has basically been established uh, through some through, through some seminal works, um, in particular works uh, by Mike Shadlin and Bill Newsom on the famous uh, random mo dot motion task. And so in this context, uh, while the sensory area is the medial temporal cortex, the area MT, the association area is is the LIP, and then the motor area is maybe the frontal eye field. Um, mm, so, so this has also been done in other modalities. In particular, uh, Sir Ranulfo Romo has done some uh, some, very, uh, some, some very prominent work here in a different task. So this is a, a tactile discrimination task. And so the Romo lab has recorded in many, many different areas along the cortical hierarchy, uh, basically supporting this, this uh, picture. So today um, I'm going to talk about the auditory system, and so the data I will be presenting comes from Shiab Shama's lab. So, uh, so Shiab's lab works with, with ferrets, and uh, so he was basically inspired by tasks done with monkeys, uh, which he adapted in the auditory domain, and so he has developed a paradigm which is based on, on go-no-go tasks. So he's studied a variety of go-no-go -no -go tasks, which all have the same structure, but then, detail, de well, he, he, he varied many of the details. So this is the basic structure of, of, of this go-no-go -no -go task. So the animal hears a sound, and so the sound can either be a target, in which case he has, it has to produce an action, or it can be, or it's a reference sound, uh, which the animal has to ignore. So this is basically a go stimulus, and this is a no-go stimulus. Um, and so, uh, so in his work, so, so well, she have looked at many different types of sounds, many di different types of actions. But one thing that is kind of constant across all of his work is that he has been systematically comparing um, an active, uh, well, active sessions in which the animal has to produce decisions. Uh, in response to sounds with passive sessions in which, uh, uh, well, the animal hears the same sounds uh, but does not need to do anything. And so he has been systematically recording his, the same neurons in both sessions and comparing their activity. And so this is just a quick summary of, of the kind of data that he has. So he records mostly in, in the auditory cortex, but in fact he also recorded in many other areas. And so this is just an illustration in a, in a specific go-no-go -no -go task. So this is the response to the go stimulus. Uh, this is the response to the no-go stimulus. And you see that, well, in the auditory cortex, well, the auditory cortex responds to both. And there's, there's some difference between the, well, the, the active context in which the animal takes decision and the passive context. But this, this difference is, is pretty small. Now, so if we go higher up through the hierarchy, this difference between the passive and the active responses becomes stronger and stronger. And so eventually, so in the prefrontal cortex, uh, while well, the prefrontal cortex responds to the ghost stimulus only in, in the active context, but not in the passive context. Um, and so this is the response to the ghost, so to the important stimulus. The other stimulus, while well, the animal does not need to do anything, 
So in the prefrontal cortex, so there's actually no response at all to the to the reference stimulus. So there's, there's a no-go stimulus, uh, whether you, you look in the active or in the passive context. So okay, so this this is basically consistent with this with this with this textbook picture, in which well, basically sensory areas respond to well to, to respond to sensory stimuli, but they're only weakly modulated by behavior, while uh, well. Higher areas uh, are strongly modulated by behavior and, and much less by, by, by stimuli if the stimuli are not behaviorally relevant. Um, however, so today uh, I'm, I'm going to argue that the sensory areas, in, in this case uh, A1, uh, might be doing much more uh, than this suggests. Uh, well, we know for sure that this picture is an oversimplification. There's a lot missing, for example, uh, well, top-down inputs are missing here. But I'm, I'm going to, to suggest that there's much more than that missing in this picture, and this is because, well, the data that I'm showing here and the data that is basically shown in all the, the classical studies, it's uh, what I would call, well, single neuron analysis, or another way to say it, it's, it's just averages over all the recorded neurons. So. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue is that if you, you actually look at the response of the population as a whole, well, we, well then you can see a, a much, uh, well, what much, a much more interesting activity there and, and uh, much richer computations. Uh, so to explain this a little bit better, let's, let's, let's step back for a second and, and, and so let's look really at what the data looks like. So, uh, so typically nowadays, People record from tens of hundreds of neurons, uh, well, either simultaneously or in different sessions, and then they, they group these different neurons. And so the data basically looks like this. So, so the data are, are, are spike times. So every, every, uh, 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 every little line here is the time of an action potential. Uh, so every line is a, is a different neuron. And typically, we have access to this data, well, over, over many different trials and in different conditions. So by conditions here, uh, well, I mean either stimuli or, uh, or different, different actions. And so that, that's a lot of data. So how, how, how to deal with it? Well, the, the classical thing to do is just to average. So first of all, average over trials. And then, so what we get is basically, well, trial average activity for every neuron. But that's, that's still a lot of data. And so most classical studies then basically go ahead and average over the population and show only average uh, activity o o o o over the population. But if you look at individual neurons, there's a lot of variability, well, a lot of heterogeneity there. And this heterogeneity m m m might contain a lot of useful information. And so to illustrate this, so well, I have a cartoon. Uh, yeah, so, so, so basically what I'm going to argue is that, well, if you go beyond just the simple averaging, so if you look at the population level, well, we, we, we can see much more. And so I had the cartoon to, to illustrate this here. So it turns out it's very similar to what we saw in the, in the previous talk. So, um, so let's look at a, the simplest pop possible population, which is two neurons. And let's forget about time. So, so now the response to a given stimulus is basically two numbers. It's the activity of neuron one and the activity of neuron two. And that basically corresponds to a dot in the two-dimensional plane. So this is the response to, 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 to stimulus one. And then for stimulus two, well, the two neurons have different activities, and this leads to a different dot on the plane. Uh, and now, so if we just average the activity of neuron one and two, so that's actually equivalent to projecting these dots on the diagonal. So the diagonal basically represents the average activity between the two neurons. And you see that in this cartoon example, so if you do this, well, you don't see any difference between the responses to stimuli one and two. But, of course, there is a big difference. And to see this difference, well, we need to look at the activity along a different direction than this diagonal. And so, well, so this is a two-dimensional case. So there's only one dimension. But if you think about n neurons, and if you're in n-dimensional space, there's basically n minus one interesting direction. So there's, uh, there's a lot that, uh, that, that can be happening. And so basically, what I'm going to be doing today is basically look for this information-bearing uh, directions beyond Averaging, and so that's this actually it's, it's actually very simple. It's just giving different weights to different neurons. So, okay, and uh, and so so this is this will be well the the, the approach that I'll take, and so, so the big question that we wanted to address is is, is how does engagement in a task uh, 
uh, modify population coding in, in the auditory cortex. And so I'll, uh, I'm going to focus on a specific uh, go-no-go -no -go task in which uh, Ferrets uh, had to discriminate uh, click trains of different rates. Uh, so this is basically what the task looked like. There was first a silence followed by a noisy stimulus that had no uh, behavioral relevance, and then came a click of trains, well, a train of clicks, a click train, and the animal basically had to decide whether this was a fast or a slow click train. And so in this case, if it was slow, well, it didn't need to do anything. It could just continue doing what it was doing. So in this case, it can just keep on licking as long as it hears reference sounds. But then when there's a fast click train, well, it has to stop licking. Otherwise, otherwise it gets a punishment. Uh, in this case, this was a, 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 mild, a mild electrical shock. And so the animals are highly trained to do this task. Uh, and so they're pretty good at it. It's not a very challenging task. Um, and so during the behavior, while well, the activity is recorded in A1, and so we have about, uh, uh, well, 370 single units with 7 to 30 units per, per, per session. And so as I said before, the, act the activity is recorded always in two different sessions. So an active session in which the animal has to really discriminate this click train, and a passive session in which it, the animal is exposed to the same stimuli but does not need to do anything. And so this so the difference uh, between, the, well, these two, these two uh, contexts is actually very big. So, so let's look at an, uh, an example neuron. So this is the average activity of, of one recorded neuron. And so this is the activity to the same stimulus, so the same uh, click train, uh, in the active and in the passive conditions. And you see that there are big differences. So first, the first difference is that in the active condition, so the spontaneous activity during silence goes up. The second difference is that, well, if you look at the responses to the stimulus, to the stimulus so here the relevant stimulus, is, are, the relevant stimuli are the clicks, well, you see that click-evoked responses actually go down, they're, they're weaker in the active than in the passive context. And so basically it looks like the noise goes up and the stimulus-evoked responses go down. And so this is, this is quite puzzling because it looks like, well, the, when the animal gets engaged in a task, while well, the signal to noise in the auditory cortex go, goes down. So, so it's a bit puzzling, but this is, this is of course, one neuron. And uh, different neurons look very different. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. So to make sure what happens at the level of the population, we adopted a, a decoding approach, where for every neuron, we determine the best filter uh, that allows it to decode the stimulus from, fr from its activity. And so every neuron had a, had a filter, and, and, and then we sum this over the population to get a sum direct reconstruction from the population activity of the, click, of the click times. And so now that we have this, so now this takes into account the whole population, and we can compare the activity in the passive and in the engage, uh, and the uh, passive and the active session. And this basically confirmed what, well, we saw the, the, on the level of that single neuron, which is that the representation of the, of the clicks is worse in, 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 in the active than in the passive case. So it looks like auditory cortex represents less well the basic features of the stimulus, which here are, are the, the click times, while when, it's, when the animal is engaged in the task uh, uh, as compared to, as, as to, to, to when it is uh, passive. So, uh, so okay. So I'm, I'm going to be building like a, a list of of, uh, of, of of conclusions here. And so the first conclusion is a bit paradoxical. It looks like the stimulus features, the encoding of stimulus features, is reduced when the animal is engaged in task. Uh, but of course, so here we try to reconstruct the stimulus. But the animal does not care about reconstructing the stimulus. What it cares about is where it wants to know whether the click train is a fast or slow click train. So they're basically two categories, and what is important for the animal is just which category the stimulus belongs to. So behaviorally, the relevant question is, can we, uh, can we distinguish the two stimuli based on, based on the activity in A1? And so now this is an, another example cell, and so here I'm showing, I'm comparing the responses to the target and the reference stimuli in the passive case and in the engaged case. And so, well, you can see, um, first thing you can see is that well, the click-evoked responses are, are weaker in the engaged state, as I showed you before. So this is consistent. 
But so what we want to know is whether the animal can discriminate between the two stimuli. And you can right away see that you can discriminate between the two stimuli just based on the, le on the overall level of the activity. Because here, in this case, the, the tar target elicits much higher firing rates than, than, than the reference stimuli. So now, again, this is one example neuron. And so now what we can do is just take the whole population and average over the whole, whole population. And if we do this, well, it turns out so, so now this is the average activity over the whole population. And now if you do this, well, population averaging basically completely washes out the difference between the two signals. And this is because some, signal, some neurons prefer targets, other neurons pre pre prefer the reference. So if you just average over the whole population, well, you basically don't see any uh, difference between the two. Uh, so, so we are exactly, so going back to the cartoon, we are exactly in this case in which, well, we know that the two stimuli elicit different responses across the population, but if you average across the population, well, there's, there's, you, you don't see this difference. So then what we set out to do is to find the axis, the relevant axis in, 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 in this space that discriminates the best the two the two responses. And so for this, we used a, a linear classifier, which we, we basically trained on, on single trial data. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and so using this, this classifier, so the classifier is trained on half of the trials and then tested on the other half. And, the, and, and what we get out is a performance which tells us how well we can discriminate the two stimuli based on, uh, uh, based on neural activity. And so I just want to point out that this is a very simple classifier. Basically what it does is it gives a different weight to every neuron and then it sums and thresholds. So it's, it's very similar to what an upstream neuron would be doing. Uh, okay, so, um, <coughs> uh, so, okay, so this is the output of, 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 of the classifier. So it gives us a classification accuracy as a function of time. And of course, before the stimulus comes on, well, we're basically at chance level. But what you can see here is that as soon as the stimulus comes on, the discrimination accuracy is very high, and it's very high both in the passive and in the active state. So although the click evoked responses go down in the active state, the discrimination is, is still very high. Okay, so this is during the stimulus, but we can continue and try decoding after the stimulus. And now here we see a big difference between passive and active, which is that, well, in the passive case, well, the discrimination basically decreases pretty quickly, while in the active state, even when the stimulus is not on anymore, we can still discriminate whether the, the previous stimulus was, was a, a go or a no, or a no go stimulus. So, so there seems to be a kind of, uh, well, memory trace of, uh, of the stimulus meaning, uh, well, in the, and this is, this is the auditory cortex. Uh, okay, so, th this is, so this is an important difference we see between passive and active, but there might be, there might be a, a simple explanation, uh, which is that, so in the, in the active state, the two stimuli, the target and the reference stimuli, they lead to different behavioral outcomes. So in one case, the animal licks, in the other case, the animal does not lick. So maybe what we're seeing here basically reflects the underlying behavior of the animal, so, so the licking. Um, so does, does, does the auditory cortex respond to licks? Well, it turns out that it does. So this is an example cell again. So this is the, uh, the activity of one cell, uh, so triggered on, on lick times, and so I average over many licks, and you see that this, this cell responds quite strongly to, to licks. And there's quite a number of such cells. So then what we did is we basically tried to identify such cells and exclude them for our, from our analysis. So to do this, what we did is we built a decoder which decodes lick times from the neural activity. And so this, this decoder gives different weights to different neurons, and we basically excluded neurons that had the strongest information about licks. So we just kept excluding neurons until we got to, well, a remaining population that basically uh, had no information about, about lick time. So, so we excluded this, the, the lick trigger activity and then repeated our analysis, and well, we basically still found the same, which is that uh, in, in the engaged uh, condition, uh, well, the, the information about the stimulus category is, well, persists well after the stimulus uh, is, is, is switched off. Okay, so I'm not sure how I'm doing uh, with time. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, 
so, so, so basically what, what this is saying is that this activity here in, in the auditory cortex, well, it's not, it's not purely sensory because the stimulus is not here anymore. It's also not uh, purely motor because we, we removed lick related, so potentially motor activity. So this is something in between. So, and, and so, so this suggests that, well, there's some, some decision related activity in the auditory cortex. Now, all that I showed you here was on correct trials. So the trials where the animal responds correctly. So we can do the decoding also on error trial. And so what we get is this black dashed line which shows that basically during stimulus, well, so we decode still quite well uh, on error trials, but after the stimulus, well, the information in error trials goes back down to, to, to the passive level, so it's, it's basically not, not there. Uh, and so this histogram just uh, well, summarizes the same, which is that, uh, so during sound, well, we can decode in both active, uh, passive, active, correct, and active error trials, but during the silence after the stimulus, well, it's only on active correct trials that we can distinguish uh, well the behavioral meaning of the stimuli from 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 the uh, from the activity. Uh, okay, so basically, so that, that adds two more points to my list. So basically, what I showed you is that the stimulus category, so basically go or no go, can be decoded uh, so in both states during the stimulus, but information about so the category of the stimulus is, is maintained during the post-stimulus silence only in the gauge state and on the correct trial. All right, so this is interesting, but so this decoding, or, uh, so, so, I mean, this categorization is it's a bit an, an abstract measure. It tells us how well we can categorize, but not why we can categorize. And so what is going on at the level of, of the neural dynamics? So we next wanted to understand a bit better, well, how does how do the dynamics of the auditory cortex change between the two states, between the passive and the active? And so, uh, so basically what we're going to do, so we're going to think about population dynamics uh, in this n-dimensional space where every, uh, uh, every axis corresponds to, to the activity of one neuron. And so, so basically what we get there is that every condition corresponds to a trajectory in this and, and, and dimensional space, which of course is very hard to make sense of. But then, well, the usual approach there is to do dimensionality reduction and find uh, a set of dimensions that carry most of the information then project to those dimensions. And so what, what I'm going to do here is that I'm, I'm going to project this n-dimensional activity to, to three dimensions. And so this is what we get. So we, we use a method which is called the Gaussian process factor analysis. And so we determine the set of axes that carries the most information uh, well, across both passive and active sessions. And um, okay, so these are complicated plots, but uh, let me sort of try to take you slowly through this. So the two different trajectories are the responses to target and reference. So this point here, so this is the spontaneous activity before the stimulus. So you remember, well, in the trial, this first silence, so spontaneous activity, then there's this noisy stimulus which has no behavioral relevance, so the activity responds to the noise stimulus, and then the click trains come on, and so, so this is where the two trajectories, so the, the, the target and the reference trajectory, actually get separated, and what you see here are basically responses to the click times. Okay, so this is, this is a complicated picture, but the only thing that I want you to keep from this is that, well, we can just look at the trajectories in the passive case, and and, and, it, and, and the trajectories in the active case, and we can see there's a big qualitative difference, which is that in the passive case, the two trajectories for the two stimuli are basically very similar, and they're very symmetric, while in the active state, well, it looks like the trajectory in response to the target is much more prominent than the response to, 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 to the reference. And so I, I, we're going to look into this in more detail. And so to, 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 to make this more clear, we're now going to project on just one single dimension. And this is the dimension that was determined by the, de, by the decoder. So that's the most information bearing uh, dimension. Um, OK, so, so here's a cartoon again of what we're doing. So, so you, me, you remember, well, we looked at the responses of, the, of, of two neurons, target and reference, and so we determined a classifier here, which basically corresponds to a direction in this, uh, in this space here. 
And now we're going to look at the whole trajectory, so starting from spontaneous activity, and we're basically going to project these trajectories onto this single axis here. And so what we're going to, to get is basically plots of uh, activity as function of time along this uh, inform information bearing axis. And so this is how these projections look like. So this is a projection in the passive condition and this is a projection in the active condition. And so here I'm cutting out the noise stimulus that comes on before. Oh, so I forgot to say something, which is that, so of course we can do these projections, but then the offset is kind of arbitrary. So to fix the offset, we're basically going to project the spontaneous activity and use it as the, as, as the origin on, in this projection. So zero means basically spontaneous activity. Okay, and so, so this is what the projections look like. So here, so I'm cutting out the noise stimulus that comes before, so spontaneous activity is, is somewhere there and corresponds to zero. And you see that in the passive case, while well, the reference and the target stimuli basically elicit uh, symmetric responses around the spontaneous activity, as we kind of saw uh, in, in, on the, on the three-dimensional uh, uh, projections. Now, if you look at the active condition, well, things change a lot because now, well, basically we see a big response to the target, but the activity in response to the reference stimulus is basically uh, indistinguishable from spontaneous activity. So it falls right on the spontaneous activity. So let's go back to the cartoon. So what is going on here? So we have responses to, to target and reference, and then we compare this with the projection of spontaneous activity, and so, and so you see here that the spontaneous activity well, lies just between the two responses. While in the, in, in the active case, when you project the spontaneous activity, it's basically indistinguishable from, from reference. So this does not mean they respond to the reference stimuli. They do respond, but the response are, are along directions that are orthogonal to, to the information bearing axis. So that when you project on this axis, well, the difference between spontaneous activity and reference evoked activity is basically orthogonal to this axis. And so basically what this shows is that in the active state, so along this specific axis uh, uh, of activity, well, it looks like the, what the auditory cortex is doing is basically detecting the target stimulus and ignoring the reference stimulus. And this is basically very similar to what I showed you from, for the frontal cortex. And in, and we actually have data from the frontal cortex here. And so these are, the, these are now the population average responses in, in the frontal cortex. And you see in the passive state, well, the, the front, frontal cortex essentially does not care. And in the active state, well, it responds, but only to the target stimulus. And so now we can compare this response in the, in the frontal cortex with this projection of the activity in A1. And you can see that there's a strong similarity here in the, in the sense that both, uh, in both cases, well, we have target detection, so the, the activity responds only to the target and essentially ignores the reference stimulus. So, but, but of course, you, you see that the latency, well, is, so this activity, this target detection appears much more quickly in the auditory cortex than in the frontal cortex, where it seems to ramp up progressively. Okay, so what this tells us is that the information about the stimulus meaning, so here stimulus meaning is just go or no go, well, seems to be encoded pretty strongly already in the auditory cortex, and that the higher up areas, well, could just very simply read out this activity and produce, and, 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 and produce the, the response. Okay, so, so that's, so, so, so basically the next point I showed you is that the encoding of, of Categories, so go and no go, will shift between passive and active from a symmetric encoding to, to a target driven, so target basically to target detection. And so now, finally, the, the last thing I want to look at is what could be the mechanism underlying this, this switch. And, uh, and so, well, there are basically two possibilities. Okay, so what we want to understand is basically how does the response switch from being symmetric around uh, around the spontaneous baseline to being highly asymmetric. And there, there are really two possibilities. One is that, uh, well, how do we go from here to here? 
and see. Whoops. Okay. Sorry. Uh -huh. oh, this, is a <laughs> this is a delay. Okay. So all right. So the the first possible scenario is that basically the responses to the stimulus to the stimuli shift going from passive to the active, so that the response to the reference stimulus basically gets aligned with spontaneous activity and, and, and becomes indistinguishable. The other possibility is that it's not the responses to the stimuli that shift, but it's that it's the spontaneous activity that shifts and that becomes aligned with the irrelevant no-go stimulus. And so we can directly test for, the, for, for these two things. And so we can basically plot again the projected responses and then compare them with the projections of the spontaneous activity in the passive and in the active engaged case. And so this is, these are the projections of activity in the passive state. So this is the responses in the passive state. And you see that, well, if you compare them with the passive spontaneous, well, we get a symmetric situation. But if you now plot here the engaged spontaneous baseline, well, it actually shifts and it gets aligned to the, with, with the response to the reference. And so we can do this also if you look at the responses to in the engaged state. So now we plot the responses to the two stimuli in the engaged state. And so this is the spontaneous activity in the engaged state. But if we plot the spontaneous activity, well, in, in, in the passive case, well, we, we lose this, this asymmetry. So, so what this shows is that basically this, this target detection, it, it seems to rely on a very simple mechanism, which is that uh, the spontaneous activity preceding the stimulus, so when the animal is engaged of the t in the task, changes and becomes aligned along this, well, along this uh, relevant direction, so it becomes aligned with the reference, so this, this basically reference and spontaneous activity are indistinguishable along the, the information bearing uh, dimension. Uh, okay, so, so that, that's my last point, which is the target detection, well, is, 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 driv is driven by a very simple mechanism, just a shift in spontaneous activity. So that, that brings me back, uh, well, to the end of the talk, and uh, well, I just uh, I hope I, that I showed you that, uh, well, this picture is, of course, an oversimplification, and in particular, so sensory areas might be doing much more than what we expect them to do. So, so just, well, the take-home message is here that, well, the information encoding in L1, well, appears to strongly depend on, on task demands. And so, so what I sh have shown you there is that A1 strongly pre-processes the activity to, re to represent, well, the relevant decision, which is here, go, no go, tar target or reference. But to see this, well, we, we need to look at the neural activity uh, at the population level, not just average over all the neurons, but, but look at, at, at the most interesting direction uh, in the activity. And so, so this is, so, so basically the paper is available at the bioarchive, and I just want to uh, thank my collaborator. So um, all the hard work was done by, by Sophie Bagul, uh, so the data was collected by um, Diego Elgeda and uh, Jonathan Fritz uh, in, in, in Shia's uh, lab in Maryland. So Shia has two labs, one in Maryland and one in ENS, which is very convenient for collaborating. And so this, this data analysis were done in, in close collaboration with Yves Bubenek, who is uh, running uh, Shia's lab in, in Paris. Uh, so, so I'd like to thank them for, for, for this nice project and thank you for uh, your attention. So I think by spontaneous, I just mean that it's not driven by a stimulus. So it's a, it's, a it's basically spiking activity that is present there in absence of the stimulus and before the stimulus comes up. Uh, so now what changes? Well, for a long time, people have realized that so in previous papers uh, from, from the Shama lab, but also from Tony Zader's lab, is that when an animal gets engaged in a task, 
so this level of spontaneous activity changes. So people knew this, but didn't know what it might be used for. But so engagement, isn't it changing spontaneous activity? Why are you still calling it spontaneous? Because it's not stimulus evoked, so it's just the animal is just sitting there waiting for a stimulus, but the neurons are active, and uh, well, it turns out that they are more active when the animal is is is, is engaged. So now what we are adding here is that uh, so we are arguing that this shift in spontaneous activity really has has a functional role, which is basically to um, to prepare the animal for receiving, uh, well, to, for ignoring no go stimuli and for detecting target, target stimuli. So, so what we're saying is that basically if you look at the spontaneous activity at the population level and now if you project it on, on the relevant axis, well, it, it basically looks undistinguishable from reference. So it looks like the spontaneous activity essentially looks like reference evoked activity along that one dimension. Yeah, so th these were mis mainly misses. So, um, yeah, the, the, the analysis of error trials is a bit challenging here because we don't have that many errors. So, uh, it's because also this is a relatively easy task. So, because you know, the stimuli the, the animal gets are exactly the same in the in the passive and the active. So, it was, if it was just sort of passive adaptation, there should not be a difference between the passive and the active session. So, so the main difference between passive and active is that is the behavior actually. So. Um, So, so that's right. I mean, so the, the network somehow re reconfigures itself that, so that any variation but along this specific direction is information about the target. So here we're looking at one direction out of n directions. So there's still, there's still differences between spontaneous activity and reference evoked activity, but along the other di dimensions. So here projecting, we're projecting just on one dimension. So just to rephrase this to make sure I understand, so it means mm -hmm. that somehow it, it, it makes sure uh, the, uh, yes, exactly. Behaviorally relevant information along this specific axis. So, no, not at all. So, uh, I mean, no, actually we have data about uh, from uh, naive animals. Um, and uh, well, so, so, so I, I don't have the data here, but let, let me go back to the decoding. Uh, yeah, so these are, these are highly trained animals. Uh, so let's look at this, for example. Uh, but so of course we can look at the same thing in a naive animal that has never done this task before. And so the, then the question is, so in a naive animal, is the, is the activity similar to the passive activity? And it turns out that it's not. So if so you do the same in a, in a naive animal, well, you can decode during a, a part of the stimulus, well, not as early in the stimulus, somewhere midway through the stimulus, but as soon as the stimulus goes away, this decoding falls, falls down to chance level very quickly. So this information here is actually not trivial. It's, 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 it seems that it's due to training. And so right now we're looking at activity throughout the, tra the training to, to understand better how this, how this emerges. Thanks very much for this uh, lovely talk. I'm glad you're showing this slide because
slide. So I'm interested in the apparent persistence of a code in sensory cortex after the end of the stimulus. So this has also been interestingly reported in the somatosensory system as well. Mm -hmm. And one can think about things like iconic memory sensory storage. What's characteristic about this is that there's a decay in the, this code. And I want to understand whether that um, decay is either the loss of information due to decay in memory, mm -hmm. or whether, because of the um, <coughs> measures that you're using of decoding, it mm -hmm. could be a change in the way that the information is coded over time. Yeah. So, 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 so I haven't told you everything about this plot. So, so basically, here we're fitting, we're determining a different decoder at every time step. So that's, so this is actually the best you can do. So it's, it's so. So this decay here is, is real. So you couldn't find a better way to extract information. Uh, now, so well, one other thing that I didn't tell you is that so this decoder can potentially change over time, right? And so we have looked at that, and it's basically well, it basically stays consistent, constant throughout, throughout the sound, but then it changes after the sound. So so the format of the information really changes between the sound and the silence period. So I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to call it memory because, uh, well, it could be something else. In particular, it could be a top-down signal that, uh, that, that's coming to, 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 to A1. Because we know that at this point, well, the prefrontal cortex is very active, so it might be sending information back.